to Dale C. Bronner. St. John chapter 15, notice verse 12. Those of you with a red letter edition of the Bible, notice that this is in red, indicating the, the words of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus, the Christ. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. And notice he said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. And I want to talk about friends indeed, friends indeed. I am really convinced that there are more people in this world of ours that die of loneliness in a place all alone than they do perhaps of anything else. It is what we may call the silent killer. It's when you're just in a place of just being alone and not feeling like you have a friend in the world. It's so easy, you know, to look at people and, and be in a crowd of people but still be all alone. I was having lunch today alone. I don't, I don't like to necessarily have lunch alone, but you know, I do that whenever I need to be in intelligent company. <laughs> and so I was having lunch today alone, and there was another man in the booth in front of me who was having lunch alone. And I noticed this man, he was an older man, and uh, he was having lunch all by himself, and he would stop the waiter could barely wait on me because this man was lonely, I could tell, because he kept engaging the waiter in conversation. And he's going back in things in history and talking about things back in the history of Atlanta and back in this place, and you remember that? Just one thing after another, he, he needed someone to talk to. And I, I saw the, the waiter finally break away, and then somebody got up in a booth next to him and they, they came and he started talking to them. And I, I was like, this guy needs a friend. My heart went out to him because he was there all alone and was desperate for fellowship. Isn't it interesting how in the greatest of our penal institutions, the greatest punishment that they can exact on a person is not beating you. It's not, you know, just putting you on both your feet in stocks and in your hand in, in cuffs. It is to put the person in solitary confinement. Isn't that amazing how just isolating them because we are created as social beings and there's a social component of every human being and I'm amazed at the individual's in this day and time, we've got so many people, there are a lot of people that are single by choice, some that are single by force, some that are single by divorce. And so there are various things that we have that have caused individuals to be single. Now, if you're single, it doesn't mean that you have to live your life in loneliness. And you'll, you'll even notice, in, as God spoke to uh concerning Adam and he, he said it is not good that man should be what alone yeah, the first thing that God the first observation I believe that God made about mankind is that he shouldn't be alone he said it is not good he had all kind of animals giraffes monkeys hippopotamus he had everything but God knew that he needed something with which he could con connect and relate to you can't have a conversation with a goldfish he needed something that he could socially relate to. There's something in us, there's a need on the inside of us to be ministered to from a social standpoint. And you don't have to be married, but you do need some friends. 
You do need somebody in your life. We get sick in isolation. And so it's not a healthy place for us to be. And so um, I, I want to you to see here that Jesus says that this commandment he said that I, I, I give is that, that you love one another as I have loved you. Somebody has said in times past, you know, that they, they needed God, but God didn't need them. But the truth of the matter is, is that God does need us because love must have an object to receive its nature. And who would God be if he didn't have something that receives the object of his love? God is love, 1 John 4, 8. God is love. And he had to create something that would love him. He first loved us and then we reciprocate that love back to God. And so if you ever get in trouble, there are people that once they get grown, they are oftentimes in more constant fellowship with their friends than they are their family. Now, one way if you want to do that, you can make your family your friends if you want to be bothered with them. But if you don't have family, there are times that you can live for a certain period of time and, and you may move to a city and not have any family in that place. What do you do? What do you do? Jesus gave us a commandment to love one another. Love flows out of relationship. And so notice he says, greater love has no one than this, than a, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. Now, one of the best ways to conquer your enemies is to make them a friend. The best way to conquer your enemies is to make them a friend. Now, there's something unique because you'll discover that in prosperity, our friends know us, but in adversity, we know our friends. You let your money run, get funny on you and see who's still hanging around. I mean, if, if you got the booze and the, and, the, and the wheels, and folks are in school, you know, they'll always have friends. But then lose your stuff. So in prosperity, you know, your friends know you, but, but in adversity, you know your friends. You begin to see who is your real friend when you go through a challenge. Because a friend in need is a friend indeed. And we're talking about a friend indeed. The one that would lay down this, this life for you. The one that will lay down his life for you. And this is why uh, ladies have to be very careful about who they, uh, a man that they get to marry them. If he's all into himself, he's not going to lay down his life for you. And if he doesn't fight to you, he's not going to fight for you. So it, you have to really look and see who is going to be a friend. You know, a real husband has to love his wife the way that Christ loved the church. And the way that Christ loved the church is that he died for it. He gave his life for it. And no man, no greater love has, has anyone than this than to lay down the life for his, for his friend. And there are so many people who find so few people that they can actually make themselves vulnerable with enough to just be a friend. To say, you know what, I know good things about you and bad things about you, and you know what, I still like you. And did you know that most psychologists say that you won't really have any more than five real genuine friends over the course of a lifetime. A lifetime. Isn't that interesting? We have a whole lot of associates and contacts and, you know, uh, you know we, we've got various names, but all of our relationships are spatial. There are some people that's really, you know, if you, you get in a real bind, you know, you call this person. You get excited about something, you're going to call this one and let them know. But you only have a real select, very, very small. Most of the time, you won't have any more than two or three real good friends at any given time. And so if you ever have one, you know, and have issues with them, don't just cut off a relationship. Remember that you never cut what you can untie. And sometimes relationships get tangled and, uh, and it makes you frustrated with the entanglement and, and it, you, you, you're tempted to get a knife or some scissors and just sever the whole thing. But you never cut what you can untie. If you can untie it, untie the thing. 
it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, the word reconcile, say reconcile. The, rec the word reconcile means to make friends again. It means to make friends again or to bring back into harmony. Uh, the word reconcile also means to resolve differences. It really, in all honesty, the word reconcile, it's, it's an accounting term. Uh, you reconcile your accounts. You know, you reconcile the records that you have with the records that the bank has. You reconcile. And you make sure that they've got all of the checks that you've written and all of the, you know, all of the deposits that you've made. You reconcile the accounts. So in relationships, you know, uh, there are going to be uh, credits and debits, and you've got to make sure that you keep that relationship in balance so you don't bankrupt the relationship. When you bankrupt that relationship in marriage, it's called divorce. That's the result of it. Once you made, you, you're overdrawn. You didn't make enough deposits. You didn't have enough assets to be able to cover all of your foolishness. <laughs> and then you bankrupt the relationship. And uh, you can make it through almost anything if you've got a friend. They have done scientific experiments to see and put a person's feet in ice water alone. And then they put the person's feet in ice water who had a friend standing by encouraging them. And the person who had a friend could stand it twice as long as the person who was alone. Isn't it amazing that God didn't really intend for us to go through some of the worst parts of our lives all by ourselves? Now, I do know that there are dimensions that even, I don't care how close you are to a friend, I don't care how close you are to your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister, there are certain things that God has designed for you to go through all alone so that there is a dependence that you have on him. He's trying to get something worked out. But there are many other things that we, we go through alone in isolation and it nearly cracks us up because we didn't have to go through it alone. That's why the Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens. He's saying that you shouldn't have to go through a lot of things that you go through all by yourself. So there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother because they would actually go and uh, lay down their life. And see, he said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, you don't just become a friend. You have to almost earn friendship to a degree. You start off as a servant. We start off as a servants of God before you ever just come into a relationship of being a friend of God. Because if you have a recalcitrant servant, they will never be your friend. If you've got somebody and you just can't get them to do right and they're serving you in some capacity, they'll never be your friend. But if, if they're a great servant, if they are responsible, if they do what they need to do, when they need to do it, that can develop into a great friendship. I can't tell you the number of people that I know who worked together and then they became the best of friends. I performed a wedding one time with... Uh, you know, where one medical doctor was marrying another medical doctor and the boys, both of the boys' parents were medical doctors. The girls, uh, mama was a doctor. And uh, there were probably 400 doctors in the audience. I've never had so many beepers going off in the service. You know, but you, you, you know what? These doctors married doctors because they were in their environment. They were in their circle. They, they, they were working together and all of a sudden, I mean, look at how many actors end up marrying each other because they are working in those same circles. And they, what started off as, as perhaps, um, you know, a, a, a co-laborer for a fellow employee, a fellow worker, then they, it, it moved from a servant thing into a friendship. And from that, it then culminated in marriage. And you really want to be able to develop the friendship. Uh, the friendship is more important. It is a more important role in a marriage than, than the romantic part. It's so that you can actually be a friend to one another in the relationship. I told you there's a bumper sticker on the back of a car saying, my wife ran off with my best friend. Boy, am I going to miss him. A man will leave his wife, but he won't leave his friend. 
So you make a friend out of your spouse. Make a friend out of them. And uh, you'll be surprised some of the wonderful, wonderful things that can actually happen as a result of just learning to make friends. And so he said, I don't even call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. If you're just a servant, you are kept at a certain distance and you're not brought into, the, in, into some of the, the, uh, the inner sides of things. Uh, let me give you some, some things here about what to look for in a friend indeed. In a friend indeed. I think that these are some of the things that Jesus will look for us if we're ever going to be considered a friend of God is that they should have a genuine commitment to Christ. They should have a genuine commitment to Christ. And just remember now, if people don't increase you, they'll eventually decrease you. You have to realize that. And so if they don't have any God in them and you keep hanging around them, after a while you'll pick up the callousness of their attitudes toward God. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot fellowship with unsaved people. You can fellowship with unsaved people, but you cannot fellowship with their works. You cannot fellowship with their works. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It didn't say don't socialize with unsaved people. You can socialize with unsaved people, but you don't enter into their, their works of darkness, their unfruitful works. So you want to be with somebody who has a genuine commitment to Christ because that will strengthen your relationship with Jesus Christ. That will strengthen it. That will strengthen your, your relationship. Genuine Christian fellowship actually cleanses us. You, 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 know, you know the scripture in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's when you're with the right kind of fellowship. One of the worst things that can happen if you get the wrong kind of person in your life. Everything in life works by relationship. And the people that are closest to you will determine your level of success. That is a principle of life. You heard me teach for years that people are just like elevator buttons. They will take you up, down, or they get you stuck. Isn't it a mess to be stuck with somebody who has gotten you stuck? You'll be surprised. Your life will take on a different color based on the quality of friends that are in your world. Now, I'm not saying to get rid of your childhood friends. But what I am saying is that you have to expand the sphere because you need different kinds of friends in your life. You don't want to just have friends who are of just one side. You need to have some that bring breath to you. They broaden you. They stretch your thinking because you will take on that. And so you need somebody where there's a genuine bond. There's a genuine bond that happens. But these, I'm, I want to give you some criteria uh, as to the types of things that, that the folks that you are going to bring into your life as a friend indeed would have, and that is a commitment of Christ. That's, that's number one. Remember, you are not only known by the company that you keep, you're also known by the company that you shun. You're known by the company that you shun. There's a Japanese proverb that says this, that when the character of a man is not clear to you, they say, look at his friends. When the character of a man is not clear to you, look at his friends. When the character of a woman is not clear to you, look at her friends. Check out the friends. And uh, you'll see something that's very, very interesting. I think all of us need, we need a friend. We want to be a friend of God. I don't know about you, but it's a, it's a great honor and, and a pleasure to be a friend of God. But God doesn't just give his friendship to us flippantly. He doesn't just give it to us lightly. Uh, you have to develop certain qualities before God can say, you know what, I can trust this person. I can trust this person. So you really want, uh, you, you, you want God as one of your friends. You really do. You ought to make that a goal is that I want to be considered a friend of God. I want to be a friend of God. Because you know that he, he already sent his son to die for us. I mean, but now the question is, would you 
Not will you lay your life down, not will you die for him. God asks us to live for him, just to live for him. But you ought to have, uh, you ought to make friends, not only make it a goal to be a friend of God, make, make it a goal to be a friend of your family. I mean, I grew up with five other brothers. That insulated me from corruption because we had a basketball team at home. And so my, my brothers were my friends. Those were my closest friends. You know, my, I had a brother that was only 11 months older than me. You know, we, we could wear each other's clothes. And so make, make your family as, as, as best as you can do that. I know that some of you all have family members that are special. I, I do understand that. And I know that some of you have them that uh, if you get too close to them, they, they will constantly bomb you for money and they haven't repaid the other money that they got. I do understand that. So, but when you find that you can have some that are, that are your friends, make them a friend, look for certain qualities in them. Then you need to find a friend in a, in a, in a person who's a Paul in your life. You find a friend in a person who's a Paul. Paul is a mentor. It's a wonderful thing if you can find friendship with a person who will be a mentor in your life. It is one of the huge factors that can give you an incredible advantage in your life. If you find a mentor who takes interest in you and it's because you show yourself friendly because you will take the high road and you allow that individual to, to become a friend of yours and you be a friend to them. Everybody needs a Paul in their life or a Pauline. Everybody. Then everybody needs a Barnabas. Paul had a Barnabas. Barnabas was not a mentor. Barnabas was a peer. He was a friend. That was somebody who wasn't infatuated with him. That was just a friend. He was an accountability partner to him. He, he was the one that would tell him if he messed up, you know, that, hey, that wasn't right. And you need people like that that are in your life. You don't want to be lonely. And then you need to be able to have a friendship not only with a, with a Paul in your life, not only with a Barnabas, but you also need to find a Timothy. That's somebody that's younger than you. Somebody who hasn't made it to where you are yet and you're pouring into their life to help them. You become a friend to somebody that you're trying to help because somebody help you one day. Somebody help you. And so we have an obligation not to pay them back, but to pay it forward. And so we reach and we give it to someone else what somebody has invested into our life. But I do want you to know that there are other relationships uh, like models. What I said, models are, are, are uh, people who, uh, who do what you like to do. Those are people who do what you like to do. Those are models. They do what you like to do. So they become a model for you in that particular era, area. Then there are mentors, and these are people that coach you. Your mentors are people that coach you. Then there are heroes. These are people that you look up to. Then there are peers. These are fellow travelers with you. All of you all in the same class. You work for the same type of organization. You're in the same department. These are peers. Then you have inner circle people. And these are the folks that are closest to you. And then you've got followers. And these are people that you lead. People that are following the clue of what's going on in, in, in your life. So always find people who have a genuine commitment to Jesus Christ, a genuine commitment to Jesus Christ. You want to have people in your inner circle who have a commitment to Jesus Christ. Here's the second thing. You want to have people in your life who have an awareness of their purpose, who have an awareness of their purpose. May I tell you that hell is purposelessness. It's a place where there's no purpose. It's a place of confusion. A place of chaos, purposelessness. And, and remember this, fellowship should be a byproduct of purpose. Your fellowship should be a byproduct of purpose. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.